Our search for serenity brings us to a strange crossroads, a disturbing, kind of confusing intersection. You look at the, the original version of serenity prayer. God, give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed. And the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Living one day at a time. Enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. That's the intersection that we end up stumbling upon this morning. The intersection of hardship and peace. And let's begin by thinking about uh, God's peace. God's peace has some unique characteristics that differentiate it from human peace. One thing is that God's peace is a fact, not a feeling. During Jesus' time on earth, Jews would welcome one another by saying shalom. Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace. And when expressed that way, what it meant is um, it was an expression of hope. It was like saying, I hope things go well for you. Shalom. I hope your family is well and your life is well. In China, they do ni hao. Ni hao. Ni is you and hao is well. So ni hao is you well. It was another expression of hope. I hope that you're well. And when Jesus said, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you, he's added something different. He says, I do not give to you as the world gives. So when Jesus said peace. It wasn't just shalom. It wasn't just nihau. It wasn't just an expression of hope. When Jesus gives it, it's an expression of certainty, not just possibility. It's not, I hope things go well for you, but when Jesus gives peace, it is things will go well for you. Your life will be characterized by fullness or by some sense of well-being. God's peace is not an expression of longing, but it, and it's an expression of certainty. Therefore, it's a fact, not a feeling. Um, he didn't say, I give you feelings of peace. He said, I give you peace. I will cause all things to work together for you. That's the truth, whether you feel like it or not. So I have a question, do you have God's peace? You say, man, I don't think so, because I feel kind of anxious, frankly, because of where things are financially or because COVID seems to be returning and it might go back to the place where and I. But God's peace is not a feeling. It's not based on a circumstance. It's the understanding at some level that we are members of God's forever family. And no matter what happens in this world, it's has bearing with respect to what we will experience long term. God's peace is a fact, not a feeling. As well, God's peace exists with troubles. On the last evening of his earthly existence, Jesus spent the evening in intimate conversation with his closest friends, the disciples, in the upper room. And then when they walked from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, he was talking with them and his comments his speeches preserved for us in John 12 verses and John 12 through John 17 um, taken by force and be executed and he lets them know that they are going to run for their lives run for their lives he and as certainly would be the case we can understand their minds were Trouble. Their hearts were troubled. They knew something cataclysmic was about to occur. And here's what he said to them. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He gives them his peace. And again, we got to remember, he's giving peace to those whose minds are besieged with troublesome thoughts. And when Jesus says, I give you my peace, it's not like they can just take those troublesome thoughts and evacuate them out of their heads. It's not possible. But still, when someone has a troubled heart, peace is what Jesus gave, an expression of certainty in times of uncertainty. The gift he gives them is a gift of peace. Apparently then, peace is relevant for those with troubled hearts. So if you are concerned about the state of your life or the state of the world, the state of the country, then a troubled heart 
is something that would make Jesus aware that a peace is the thing that you would give to somebody with a troubled heart. Um, a little later in the same evening, Jesus commented on the troubles the disciples would face in the remaining years of their life, not just what was going to happen at that time, but what was going to happen as he as he pointed to the future of their lives. They would experience not only troubled hearts in the present, but troubled lives in the future while on earth. And this is what he had to say to them. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And again, he promises them his peace. Peace is not just relevant then to those with troubled hearts. It's relevant to those with troubled lives who, as they look at their life and they look at the things they're going to be encountering, there's cause for concern. Peace is something then relevant. Those who have heavenly peace then have earthly troubles. And that's significant to understand. There is an intersection or a crossroads of hardship and peace. When we experience horizontal difficulties, in that context, we experience vertical peace, human hardships, divine peace. If you have God's peace, then it doesn't mean that there aren't challenges in your life that are concerning to you, that there will be things in your life that will be concerning and peace is relevant to managing those things. The, um, in the world, peace is associated with the absence of troubles and the removal of danger. God's peace is not tied to the absence of danger. God's peace is not tied to the absence of danger. God's peace is tied to the presence of God in the context of danger, not the absence of danger, the presence of God in the presence of danger. That's what divine peace seems to be about. God doesn't promise, God promises, excuse me, to walk with us through the difficulties and accomplish his purpose. Let's think about a couple things. Then. Let's think about human hardship, and, and then we'll try to focus on, okay, in the context of human hardship, and let's try to understand that. Hardship is difficult, not just because of our circumstances, but because of what the circumstances cause us to think and feel inside. Let's think about that together a little bit, about our thoughts and feelings when we go through difficulties. And then we'll think about how we can experience divine peace in the midst of experiencing human hardships. Um, with respect to human hardships, a verse that we talk about every once in a while, but I, um, it's very intriguing, this verse is to me. Let's, let's follow the logic. Uh, James begins with a question, and he's talking to individuals in small Jewish Christian churches. Jewish Christians had been scattered from Israel into the Roman Empire, and they exist in little house churches. And what's happening, James hears that there's infighting between the house churches. So there's bickering that's going on. And, and so the difficulties of being a Jewish Christian in the Roman Empire is apparently causing Jewish tempers to flare. And so there's fighting, and James then addresses, and he begins with a question. Look at this question. What causes fights and quarrels among you? I love, I love the question. How, how would you answer that? What causes fights and quarrels among you? <laughs> well, it's easy enough. It's him. I mean, I mean, if you had to live with him, I mean, you'd fight and quarrel too. It's her. I can't believe what she says. It's them. It's, it's those people. It's that political party. It's that political party. That's what causes fights and quarrels. How in the world can we not fight and quarrel when that guy's president or when this guy's president? Uh, of course, fights and quarrels, it's easy to understand why there's fights and quarrels. Because of what, what's happening out there. Look what James says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? The word desires is the word pleasures. Here's the deal. It says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? 
You know what the deal is, James says? It's not really about what's going on around here. It says it's your pleasures that battle within you. See, apparently we want to be pleased. I mean, who wants to be pleased? Come on, who wants to be pleased? Now, we all want to be pleased. Everyone, You know what he's suggesting? The problem is we are not pleased by one thing. We're pleased by different things. And our, the things, our pleasures, are at war within us. So there's this pleasure. And when we gratify this pleasure, we're not pleased because we're not gratifying that pleasure. And when we gratify that pleasure, this pleasure is not pleased. So if your pleasures are at war and you live to be pleased, what's going to happen? I'm going to ask the question again. If your pleasures, if our pleasures are at war within us, and so for me, if my pleasures are at war and I live to be pleased, I am going to live at war with myself. Gratifying this pleasure will cause this pleasure to be disappointed. And so I'm not going to be a person who's going to appear very peaceful. That's what he ends up saying. You want something, but don't get it. So what do you do? You kill and covet. You try to figure out how can I get what I want. You quarrel and fight. You don't have because you don't ask God. Our pleasures are at war within us. It creates a deep problem. That we're not going to be able to be satisfied with our life. Because even though when that pleases me, I'm displeased over here. And when I'm pleased over here, I'm displeased over here. Uh, James goes on, he says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your, same word, pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You've got to be careful here. Is it bad to be pleased? Bad to be pleased? No, of course not. The problem is that if I am pleased by these things, then I'm not going to be able to continue to be pleased. If I gratify that desire, I'm still not displeased, and that's the problem. Um, to live for pleasure, though, is the primary value of the world. Again, we have to be very careful. When we think of the world, we think of irreligious people. The world is irreligious people, like people who are really wealthy or people who work in secular occupations, and the only and the world is secular. And in Jesus' time, the world wasn't secular. The world that he's describing is sacred. It was in Israel, Israel was a theocracy, and the political leaders were the religious leaders. So the world in Jesus' time was those individuals who believed that we can and should be able to be pleased. And what James describes is that that is worldly. Again, I want us to be very careful. Does that mean then to really be a Christian, you've got to walk around and, you know, like Eeyore? And no, it's not saying that. It is saying, though, that if we're going to experience some sense of peace, it's not going to come from being able to pursue and gratify our pleasures. If, if that's your objective to pursue, and if that's my objective to pursue and gratify pleasures, we're not going to be at peace because our pleasures are at war. That makes sense. What do we do? Let's think about it. What does James say? What does James tell us for us to do? You know, there is a thing, though. I, I ran into this little quip once. It's kind of the way the world, and again, it's not, the sec, not just the secular world. It's not just them outside the walls of the church. Uh, the world can exist very comfortably in the church, and when the church exists, to primarily be pleasing. Yeah, you see what the problem. I heard it says, get what you can, can what you get, sit in your can. <laughs> uh, that seems to be the, the value of the world. Uh, that's what the world espouses. Get what pleases you. Look what it says. So why, what's the problem? Here's what James says. 
Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the Spirit He caused to live in us envies intensely? We've talked about that before. The Spirit He caused to live in us envies intensely. The, the He caused to live in us is God. So God places within us something that envies intensely. And what it's describing, we have a natural reaction when we have frustrated desires. It's not something that you have to learn. It's something that comes hardwired, and it's hardwired in all of us. The Spirit He caused to live in us envies intensely. What intense envy is, we've described it before, if I like something that you have, let's say I'm looking at Brett, and I'm looking at Brett right here, and I'm saying, well, I have kind of a similar shirt, but I like your shirt because yours is more colorful. And so mine's kind of bland, and yours is really colorful, and so... Simple envy is, geez, I wish I had a shirt like Brett. <laughs> but if you let that stew a little bit, now let me sit along a place, and so I'm looking at Brett's shirt, and I'm looking at mine, and I'm looking at Brett's shirt, and I'm looking at mine, and over time, this simple envy becomes something more intense, intense envy. And what intense envy is, not I want Brett's shirt, but geez, I, I kind of want to, I kind of want to, do something bad to Brett because he has a better shirt than I do. That's intense envy. Intense envy is not just when you want something someone else has, is when you resent them for having it. That's what ends up happening with the spirit he caused to live intensely. You know what we end up doing then? We end up experiencing resentment and remorse. When we have frustrated desires, here's what naturally happens. We assume that well, am I being punished? Why shouldn't I be able to get what I want? And we end up assigning blame. That's what James is describing. Um, it's the natural process. So when we don't experience what we want, it's not just that we're going to be neutral about it. Well, I'll let it go. I'm going to look at what I want, and I'm going to say, why shouldn't I have it? And I'm going to blame somebody. And I'm going to blame somebody not because... I'm doing something wrong. You know why I'm going to blame somebody? Because the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely. And we are hardwired to blame ourselves. And some of us do that. When we don't get what we want, some of us blame ourselves. It's my fault. I am not the person I should be, and that's why I don't have what I want. Some of us assign blame internally. If I were to come to you and say, we have a problem, some of you would automatically say, what did I do? And even before we heard that the problem was you or somebody else, we automatically assume some others of us, if you know, there's a problem, and some, of our, some others of us would automatically say, well, what did you do? You know, I mean, you know, it's, we don't apply it internally, we apply it ex externally, but we all blame someone. All of us, when we have frustrated desires, we assign blame. We hold somebody accountable. Something's wrong. I should be able to be pleased. That's human hardship. And so here's what it looks like. Craving, contempt, conflict. I want what I want. Craving. Why am I not getting it? Contempt. It's your fault. It's my fault. And then we end up fighting. Craving, contempt, conflict. Craving, contempt. You know what I call that? A whirlpool. It spins faster and faster and faster and faster. And you know what we do to get out of something like this? That's where addictions come from. Where addictions come from. If I buy something or do something or get drunk, it temporarily helps me to forget that I'm caught in this whirlpool. But then what happens the next morning when you wake up? What do we do with this? I don't know if you can recognize yourself in this. I can recognize myself in this. And what the Bible says is something universal. All of us deal with it at some point. We're surfacing it. And let's, what does the Bible say? How do we handle something like this? Let's talk about that. Talk about divine peace. The verse we looked at a couple weeks ago, in fact, but a really good verse. Look what it says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds, your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace protects your hearts and minds. Again, peace here is not a feeling. You know what the, really, you, when you think of peace, you might think of UN peacekeeping forces. UN peacekeeping forces 
don't brandish flowers. They brandish weapons. And what they do, they create a perimeter so that individuals who they feel are in danger can experience peace. Peace, then, that's what it's really like. God's peace is not a feeling. It is something God established a protective perimeter and allows our minds to focus on what he says. Without this protective, protective perimeter, our minds are capsized by what if? Oh, no. What if? Oh, no. What, oh, no. What if? And what if? And oh, no's assault our minds. And we think about how can I, how can I deal with this? And what God says is that his peace will erect a protective perimeter that will allow us to be mindful of what God says to us. Now, this is not a magic cure. It doesn't happen just because we flip a switch. We have to learn. We think about his promises, his commitments. And as his promises and commitments, we learn, rather than grumble, we learn to present our requests to him. Listen to me. This is a really hard thing to learn. I find it very challenging. It's very easy for me to blame. It's hard for me to consistently learn to talk to God about what I want, about what I need. I think, well, God already knows. You know what God says, even though he already knows? You know what he says to us? I want you to present your request to me. And if I if you present your request, here's what I will do. If you learn to present your requests, this is what I will do. I will dispatch peace that will create a protective perimeter that will gradually allow you to be mindful of my promises, the peace that I give you. And as you learn that that peace you will have difficulty, but you'll also experience peace in the midst of it. That's what he's talking about. I'll be honest with you, it's not going to happen by next week. And it, it doesn't happen quickly. So if you said, no, nah, you know what, Mike, tried it. <laughs> I tried that whole present your request to God, and it didn't work. You know, so I threw it up there, and, and it was like I threw up a prayer, and it didn't get answered. And so it's, it's not something, it's it's. This is, it develops like a muscle. And if any kind of discipline, some of you are runners, some of you might lift weights, some of you do exercise, and you remember what it was when the first time you jumped on the bike or the first time you headed out to the bike path or the first time you started to exercise, you couldn't do as much, could you? You know, you, you might have thought I could, but little by little by little, the muscles develop the ability to remember and that's the way it is spiritually. Little by little, we learn to present our requests. And uh, that's not just the only thing it does. It, it ends up describing what else we do. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. First, present your requests. Then it says, ponder the things that are admirable. I want you to be careful here. What we tend to do is jump over the first. We tend to forget presenting the request. I just need to snap out of it and think about good things. And then gradually, I will make myself. That doesn't work. Don't do that. God says, I need for you to learn to present your request to me. I need for that to happen. Then I'll dispatch my peace. And then what will end up happening, then you'll be in a position where you'll be able to start to be more mindful of what's right, admirable, pure, praiseworthy. You start to be able to think about the positive things. Some of us, we try to think about the positive things in order to kind of dislodge the negative things. You understand how many of you, we, we do that? We try to make ourselves be positive. That's not what it's saying. Think about the things that you need. Don't squash them down. Don't blame. Don't push them out. Talk to them. You know what, God? I, I, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. You do that. He starts, you learn to experience his peace. Then you know what you can do next? After you've lifted your request up, then think about your life. 
What's admirable? What's right in your life? What has God gifted you with? Health? Some relationships? You're learning about him? Then you can start to think about, ponder the positive things. And it goes on from there and finishes by saying this, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. It's interesting, isn't it? You present your requests and the peace of God is in you. You practice the things and the God of peace will be with you. So it seems to suggest this. Present, ponder, repeat. Present, ponder, repeat. Why would we do that? Craving, contempt, conflict. Craving, contempt, conflict. How can we make our way out of that whirlpool? Learning, present, ponder, repeat. Develop it as a habit. It's not going to develop overnight. But as we do so, um, we find an ability to experience peace. There was this, and we're done with this, there was a, uh, a time that God told the disciples, Jesus, excuse me, told, Jesus is God, but you know, at, Jesus told the disciples to get in the boat, and he said, we're going to go to the other side. And in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the, the, the journey, a storm broke out in the waves, and it doesn't look like a very peaceful thing. And that's, I saw this quote, sometimes God calms the storm. In Mark 4, that's what happened, that peace be still. Everything was quiet. But sometimes hardship and peace exist together, and this is the truth. Sometimes he lets the storm rage and calms the child by gradually helping the child to present, ponder, repeat. Present the request, ponder what's admirable, and repeat. That's the way to deal with craving, contempt, and conflict. Let's stand for closing prayer. Father, if we could, if we could package this and sell it, yeah. But it's not something that can be internalized easily. It takes time. You would have us be mindful of your promises to us, your commitments to us. To be able to place our faith in you means that we have to place your faith, our faith in your commitments to us, your promise. And as we are aware of the circumstances of our life, gradually being aware of your commitments to us and your promises allow us to present our requests and experience the peace which you dispatch, allows us to think in the midst of even what's difficult, what's also positive, and it enables us, as we repeat it, to experience peace. Uh, not short term, but Jesus, this is what you experienced when you were on earth, and this is what you want to lead us to be able to do. So continue to lead and guide us, in Jesus' name. Amen.